Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India As I was telling you, Marx is in many respects a classical economist par excellence. He was he gave a completeness to Ricardo's analysis, which did not happen in Ricardo's own writings. Like Smith and Ricardo, Marx was also thinking in terms of England as consisting not just England, as society as consisting of three classes of people, the landowners, the capitalists and the workers. I am saying this because although the economics of laissez-faire attempted to look at in people as individuals dealing with the market, evidently they dealt with as with the market as constituents of different groups of people. In fact, Smith was very clear about how not just the landowners and the capitalists and workers earned their livelihood, but also how they spent it as too was Ricardo. Labor theory of value was central to Marx, in fact slightly more central to Marx than it was even to Ricardo. We know that in the case of Adam Smith, there was an ambivalence. On the one hand, he was committed to labor theory of value as an absolute. On the other hand, he had a composite notion of price and cost. The cost of something also had to include the rewards of other factors of production than labor. This is also part of Smith. Whereas, this composite quality of the price was abandoned by Ricardo and he committed himself to labor theory and labor as an absolute value. However, he was not able to deal with capital lucidly. If you were looking at labor as an absolute, then how do you explain the idea that labor produced much more than what it needed for its own survival? And where did that surplus go? And who were appropriating that surplus? Ricardo's theory explained of course, capitalist profits, it explained landowners rents and it also argued that the rent of the landowner was not part of the price very lucidly, but profits were certainly constituents of the price. If that were the case, what is the point of talking about labor theory as an absolute? So, this area of doubt remained in Ricardo also. The genius of Marx lay in showing that everything was capital. Capital too was only so much labor. In fact, his definition of value was so lucid and his definition of capital was so lucid that you could all reduce it all to a single desideratum. All of labor was capital and all of value was labor. So, this was Marx's genius in the sense that he carried Ricardo a lot further than he himself could carry himself. But before we go into that, we must acknowledge also that Marx used labor theory of value much more intensively than Ricardo did. For Ricardo, labor theory, labor was only an absolute value. Whereas, for Marx, 
labor was the entity around which all of history revolved and all of human history were a history of human labor and subjugation of labor in order that the output of labor might be appropriated. So, Marx looked, looked upon all of history as a continuum of subordination and dominance by one who worked and over him the dominance of one who did not work. And he believed that this single truth of history which was subordination of labor to dominance by others took various forms and various shapes in various epochs. The substance of human history is subordination and dominance, but the substance took varied forms in different epochs and different times. And therefore, the understanding of history is important to understand the modality of dominance and control through different times. So, he used the historical method, so which was why his method was known as historical materialism. Materialism because he was, he was a materialist, he did not believe in any metaphysical entity, he was an atheist, he believed the material world around us which we see is all that exists which can be understood by human reason. So, it was materialism, but materialism from a historical point of view because everything has a history to it, everything is becoming and will become into something else in the future. This was Marx's idea of things and he used Hegel's method of studying history, which is dialectics. Have you studied Hegel? I believe you have. Can you tell me something about Hegel? Hegel was a dialectical idealist. Uh. Fantastic. Why do you call him an idealist? Because his thought was entirely in the realm of you know the perfect the uh, of ideals. You know. mm -hmm. He believed that all of human history was finally moving towards an idea. Perfection. Does it go back to somebody else whom you knew? Plato. Plato? Yeah, Plato ah, more than Plato, Aristotle. Aristotle was a positive man. He was looking at the world as moving towards this perfection. No, Plato was not so much concerned about world moving towards this perfection, but as constituting this perfection. But it is Aristotle who was positive. Oh, yes, he was an empiricist, uh, he was a scientist, he was everything, he was a lot of things, but this Platonic idealism was embodied in much of what Aristotle was saying in a positive sense. Anyway, right, if you have a chance, do read a book, a lovely book by Karl Popper, P O P P E R open society and its enemies. It is a classic. It tracks the platonic roots of Marx, Hegel and everyone of the modern times, very beautifully written, open society and its enemies. Anyway, so as you rightly said, Hegel believed that all history was a manifestation of the idea and was the unfolding of the idea in the dialectical process till finally, perfection of idea is reached. So, you are right absolutely, Marx used dialectics too, but Marx was a non-metaphysical person, he was a non-idealist in that sense, Marx was a materialist. Marx saw that the material conditions of human existence contained within itself both the thesis and antithesis. Every human epoch is materially considered as consisting of a thesis and an antithesis and would lead to the next epoch dialectically as a synthesis. So, as far as Marx is concerned, capitalism itself 
would follow capitalism itself follows primitive communism, slavery, feudalism all of which are dialectical precedents of capitalism. Each of these epochs had its own dialectical contradictions and led to the next one as a synthesis and capitalism itself according to Marx is a synthetic outcome of the internal contradictions of feudalism. This is an important thing to remember that although Marx makes a brilliant analysis of capitalism using classical political economy's tools, his commitment to classical political economy was only in the sense of the analysis, economic analysis of capital, but his view of capitalism itself was historical. Hmm? Okay. Now, Marx begins with the proposition that all value derives from labor like Smith and Ricardo and even Malthus and like Malthus and Ricardo, he admits that if labor is the source of all value and if labor is producing more than what it needs for its subsistence there must be something else in the lab, in the system too. That is how profit is justified in Malthus and Ricardo, but in Marx it is more general. All others who do not work who dominate labor have access to this surplus. So, the existence of the difference between a positive difference in numbers between what labor produces and what it consumes is the index of exploitation. Because labor produces the surplus and somebody else is appropriating it. And therefore, it is clear all kinds of surplus in society are only products of surplus labor. And through history, during the time of slavery, you had the slave owner who appropriated the surplus output which came out of the surplus labor of the slave. Under feudalism, you had the landowner, the aristocracy appropriating the surplus output of the serf out of his surplus labor. And under capitalism, you had the capitalist appropriating the surplus value of the output produced by surplus labor, I am sorry, produced by surplus labor time. So, all history has been characterized by the existence of the exploiter and the exploited the worker has been exploited. Now, this is the point at which he takes a big step away from Ricardo and company. Because Ricardo and company admit that as long as there is a difference between total labor output and subsistence wage, this surplus is something which goes to profits and rents and so forth, but they did not think of the idea of exploitation. Whereas, Marx is very clear. The labor laborer is not a charitable institution, it does not give away things, it does not manufacture things and then give it away to his some capitalist saying okay, you enjoy your life too. No, it is taken from him and conditions of society are so organized that he has no option but to comply. So, in Marx there is a whole social framework which creates the rules and norms and conditions of work with which the worker has to comply, which are the sources through which the surplus labor and the output of surplus labor, the surplus output is appropriated. It is a historical process because the rules, norms and institutions vary according to times. So, this is clear and society is therefore characterized by a fundamental conflict 
the conflict between the worker who is the source of all value and others who appropriate the surplus from the worker. So, there is a fundamental antagonism in all society between worker and the exploiter. So, under slavery it used to be the slave and the master of the slave. Under feudalism it was the serf versus the landlord. Under capitalism it is the worker and the capitalist. The forms have changed, rules and institutions have changed, but the modality is the same which is exploitation according to Marx. Therefore, the justification for his use of dialectical method. Throughout the thesis and antithesis of different epochs were contained within the epochs, whether it is slavery or serfdom or capitalism. No? Okay. Now, some terminology. The conditions of production, which is again expression used by Ricardo and others, which refers to basically the way work is organized, the technology which determines the capital output ratios and the organization of time schedules, work schedules, all these are conditions of production. And based on these conditions of production, there are relations of production. There are for instance managers and the workers in the factory and the managers are themselves related to the capitalist owner of the factory. So, the conditions of production exist within the framework of relations of production. The organizational structure of the form of production whether it is a modern factory or whether it is slavery the organizational structure of the form of production gives you fundamental production relations. Whether it is a slave related to the master, whether it is a serf related to the landlord or the worker related to the work uh, to capitalist. So, this relationship which is called production relationship along with the conditions of production which is given by technology, which is given by demography, which is given by various physical factors, resource endowments and so on and so forth. Put together these constitute the economic base of a society. This is the ultimate stamp of the materialist definition of Marx of himself, because he says all societies must have an economic base and the economic base consists of production conditions and production relations. However, the economic base is surrounded, embedded in and filled with a lot that is not apparently economical. For instance, the worker in a factory and the landlord and the employer, the capitalist will not pass each other for the first time in the day without greeting each other. Although the greeting is not a part of the exploitative relationship, the greeting is a way in which that relationship is articulated. <coughs> Likewise, socialization of people into the lifestyles into which they are living. Likewise, the educational process which instills knowledge not just about science and technology and mathematics, but also about the society and its structure and its politics and its history. All of these are processes through which or all of the all of these are things in which an economic base is embedded. There is a whole lot of political relationships. There are political parties with ideologies, there are parliamentary or non parliamentary or monarchic or dictatorial political systems. There are different types of enforcement regimes, 
there are regimes in which enforcement is very explicit, there are regi regimes in which en enforcement is not explicit, but either way enforcement of rules, regulations is a part of society. So, you have politics, you have culture, you have social institutions, you have belief systems, you have religions, you have everything which is the totality in which the economic base is embedded. And therefore, all these put together are addressed by Marx as superstructure. So, a society or a social formation as Marx calls it is a combination of the economic base and the superstructure and every social formation in every epoch is called a mode of production. So, you have a slavery mode of production, you have a feudal mode of production, you have capitalist mode of production your socialist mode of production and so on. <coughs> In a very simple description you can say it all begins with primitive communism in which the dialectics are not so much institutional, but human in terms of charismatic differences among members of small communities, which lead to basic hierarchies among themselves and then which lead to the early emergence of the notion of property on to human labor as a property under slavery and land as a property to which human labor is locked as serf under feudalism and then the complete liberation of labor under capitalism from all forms of institutions from land from slavery everything the labor is 100 percent free under capitalism to sell his labor power. So, you have whole emergence of forms superstructures, economic basis across epochs from one to another. And in this historical process, Marx finds capital, capitalism is central because it almost seems to have come to a culmination of everything that started with primitive communism. So, let us see what Marx has to say about capitalism. The difference between all capitalist and pre-capitalist economists I am sorry, capitalist and pre capitalist societies, among other things, is the fact that under capitalism labor is free, whereas it is not free in pre capitalist societies. Labor is either locked to land as in feudalism or locked to ownership by a master under slavery, whereas under capitalism labor has no constraint in the process of converting itself into a commodity. So, what is crucial is to note that labor is a commodity. Since labor is a commodity, what is paid to the labor is the value of labor to the employer. Right? And what is produced by the labor is the value of the output in terms of labor. Right? So, the output has a value in terms of labor and labor itself has a value in terms of the rewards paid to it by the employer and the surplus therefore is not just surplus as in previous epochs, it is surplus value. Why does this happen? It happens because the capitalist has a certain amount of capital, call it M. He pays it to the labor to purchase labor power 
and gets it converted to some C commodities. So, M gets converted into some commodity C right and this commodities at the end of it get converted into more capital when it is sold into some M prime. So, that this end M prime is always higher than the initial M and the difference between M prime and M is a surplus. surplus under capitalism therefore is surplus value it is how labor is valued in the society it is how output is valued in the society and the difference between the way output is valued and labor is valued is surplus value hmm? output itself goes into three directions when it is distributed as a, as a final distribution of the society a part of the output of a society goes to sustain all the workers as the aggregate wage bill it is called variable capital. Variable capital because around it the technology the machinery the equipment are organized and the, and the quantum of labor can vary in the usage of these constant forms of capital. What we know today as fixed capital Marx used the term constant capital. So, you have constant capital and variable capital. This constant capital the part of the output that goes towards constant capital or K is some fixed entity initially we can assume that so. We can assume that initially some stock of capital exists and it has to meet an annual depreciation costs for replacement of this equipment and that depreciation is constant capital. Then the other is variable capital which is what goes to labor and what remains is surplus after what is paid to cons paid towards constant capital what is paid towards variable capital what remains is surplus no is clear. So, what is the objective what is the maximizing function of a capitalist in this system take a short at will absolutely the whole purpose of capitalist in being part of this is to maximize surplus value. How can that happen? You have a little arithmetic here y equals v plus k plus s and you want to maximize s absolutely because k is constant it is given you can touch it. So, the fundamental antagonism between the worker and the capitalist is in the initial accounting of the enterprise itself. You cannot maximize s unless you minimize s I am sorry unless you minimize v in a constant situation in a unchanging static situation. Dynamically of course, y will change and then others will also change, but with a constant or a given y s can be maximized only if v is minimized no. So, that is what you find here. So, what is the index of exploitation in the situation S upon V is not it. So, the idea is go on increasing S and how can the worker and how can the factory do it. Suppose V is given at some subsistence wage. and how can you increase y such that s can increase I repeat suppose you have a factory 
with a certain number of workers, some machinery, equipment, technology. Now you want to increase the surplus produced by the workers in this factory. How can you organize that? Over time or extra hours, right? In other words, the initial stage in which capitalism works, it works by increasing labor time. Surplus labor time is maximized in order that surplus value is maximized. This stage and this form, it is known as absolute surplus value. It is absolute because we have no option but to go on increasing labor hours and therefore increase output so that your surplus is maximized. Is this clear? But can this be done for a long time forever? Beyond a point the laborer cannot work. There is a limit right beyond which he cannot work anymore. So as you are approaching the limit, you have got to start thinking in terms of other ways in which the output can increase. One way of doing this is improving the quality of labor, so that the same one hour of labor time might produce an hour and a half quality of work. No? So, since you cannot increase the number of hours, you try to increase the quality of the number of hours of work that the labor works. In other words, you try to increase productivity of labor. And how can you increase productivity of labor? By changing technology. So, technological innovation becomes necessary. So once you change technology, the same laborer now produces more in the same number of hours as he did earlier, right. So now you have an open door to surplus maximization because you can go on changing technology, go on improving productivity of labor and then go on maximizing surplus. So this stage is the stage which is known as relative surplus value. What is crucial is to realize at this point that once you move from this first stage to the second stage, k is no longer a constant. k increases, you have got to spend money on technology, you have to invest more money, in other words your expenditure on capital increases. So, your y or your output has to grow now partly to sustain your workers and partly to sustain a growing investment outlay. Hmm? So, this is a dynamic stage of capitalism. Now, once investment goes on, it is not simply a question of checking out the productivity increases and tying investment to them because your productivity increase is also to be compared with what that in investment is bringing for you. In other words, there are two considerations which become important at this. One is extraction of surplus value, one, but equally important the rate of return on your investment. Sometimes the rate of return might be very high, 
and it might end up also in high surplus value. Sometimes rate of return might be low because the particular technology chosen might not be very high yielding technology in terms of productivity, but still the capitalist might follow that. But when he does that, he is doing that under low rates of return, low rates of profit. No? Is that clear? So, this might happen. So, the dynamics of capitalism brings in a situation of uncertainty. Rate of profit may rise, it may fall, and it is not entirely in your hands, it is in the hands of the system as a whole. So, economic fluctuations become a part of the system commencing at this stage. So, I repeat the system as a whole now looks like this. On the one hand, the workers are working and since the capitalist is growing, the workers also form unions to try and bargain, negotiate, agitate and so forth for better terms. So, if they find that a new technology comes in and it is making more money for the capitalist, the worker would, the union would immediately agitate and claim a part of that additional earnings it would say okay you are making 30 percent growth in the output because of this technology let us have a 30 percent growth in our incomes the tech, then the capitalist might bargain and say no 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 30 percent is too high i want my margin too so they will negotiate haggle and so forth and eventually they will arrive at something like what 20 25 percent 15 percent whatever but the unions become a very important institution in the system at this point because they are the ones who bargain and get something out of this gain for the workers. Hmm? So, this is on the workers side. And once the worker bargains and gets what he wants, next time the employer is pushed into another round of technological improvements because he says I cannot sustain so many workers paying such high salary. I must have some retrenchment. I cannot pay this high salary to all the workers. I can only have less workers than before. So, he brings in a labor saving technology once more and this time he looks at how many workers he is able to remove from employment. No? So, there is prosperity with this technology. At the same time, there is exploitation in the sense that the workers are thrown out. And as workers are removed from employment in this manner, more and more and more workers get onto the margins, they do not have jobs. At the same time, there are workers who are benefiting from this, who are able to get higher pay because they are more productive and so on and so forth. So, among the workers themselves, there grows up a difference between highly paid and not so highly paid workers. So, the workers who are marginalized in the process who are thrown out of employment, they become what Marx calls the reserve army of unemployed. The reserve army of unemployed. Hmm? They are the reserve army because they are available to him. In case he wants workers, they are there and yet they are a reserve for which he has to pay nothing. 
they are just there, they are hanging around. Later on as capitalist society becomes more democratic, you might have unemployment benefits. During, during times of unemployment, the workers might find themselves getting some aid from the government to sustain themselves, but for which the tax is paid by the capitalist and so forth. So, in an indirectly in more democratic societies, the capitalist ends up paying a tax which will sustain the workers when they are in the state of reserve army. But in the earlier stages, the worker is obliged to do nothing. I am sorry, the capitalist obliged to do nothing. He just lets them be and then they constitute the reserve army of unemployed. That is one. Second, the workers who have better salaries, what about them? They have the carrot of even better lifestyles in front of them, but they cannot get it because that is about the limit to which they can get. So, there is more frustration in these workers too. There is a lot of promise in the system which the system does not deliver. This whole process is called immiseration of the workers. So, in the society as a whole, there is a great dynamic going on, there is increasing pressure, counter pressure. The workers want more and under pressure the capitalist might yield that he just come back with another labor saving innovation and take more workers off. So, this is pressure, counter pressure. So, what is happening in this frame? more and more workers are getting unemployed. Constituting the reserve army of unemployed. In modern economies, how many of these workers, how much, what number of workers, what percentage of the working force, what percentage of the population can be sustained as being unemployed in this fashion? essentially due to technological changes, adaptations and so forth. How many of them can be sustained is a function of how much can be afforded, right? And how much can be afforded is a function of how much tax can be raised to support them through social security. So, eventually the numbers come down to an affordable feasible number, which is what is described in modern unemployment statistics in developed countries. An unemployment rate of 2 percent, 3 percent, 2 and a half percent, 5 percent, 4 percent, whatever that is a sustainable level of unemployment in the system due to what in modern macroeconomics is called structural and frictional unemployment. Essentially, it is a reserve army of unemployed in a dynamic process of capitalist development. So, this is one thing that is happening immiseration. The other thing is the world around the capitalists is becoming more uncertain. He is not very sure that the innovation he makes, the technological change which he institutes is something which will always pay what he expects it to pay for three reasons. The first reason is that the technology might not perform as its blueprint guarantees, right. Second, each technological change is a learning process. So, the workers have to be retrained, re-educated and that is an expensive project. 
So, depending upon what the technology costs in terms of funds, the capitalist has to think is it worth my while and it is worth my while if it yields a good net income over and above the cost of training and re-equipping, retooling and so on and so forth. Now this becomes unpredictable, it becomes unpredictable because there are other factors than simply technology involved here. The market is involved here, the cost of this technology will depend upon how costly funds are. In other words, if in the system interest rate is rising, then the funds are not cheap, right. So, if the interest rates are falling, then the funds are cheap. Do you remember the old mercantilist argument that interest rates must be kept low, so that business can grow and the economy can expand? There is a lot of sound common sense in it from this Marxian point of view. No? The capitalist would wish interest rates to remain same, remain low and well managed. But whether that is the case we or not, we do not know. But one thing is, the capitalist has more variables under his consideration now than before. There is greater uncertainty in calculation in his mind than before. So, his rate of profit becomes a question mark in front of him. What will they be in the long run? What will be they, they be 5 years from now? Because I am committed to wave after wave of technological in innovations and improvements to, to protect myself. It is no longer a question. You see, it has become a very interesting game. Initially, I did all this technology change in order that I might maximize my surplus value, absolute relative, sur relative surplus value, no. But now, it has become a kind of a chess game between the workers and me. They keep pushing me for higher wages and to protect myself I have to bring in one more innovation and when I go into one more innovation I have got all these calculations to make and I expose myself more to risk. So, the world of capitalists becomes more unstable and since businesses might rise and fall investments are made and the investments may fail or succeed and if investment investments succeed the economy takes a beating i am sorry if the investments fail the economy takes a beating the investments succeed then the economy is on the boom so what you find now are the rise and fall of the income levels in the economy cyclically through time so, this is something else which the capitalist has to reckon with at this point in time, no. So, you find emiseration, you find the world of the capitalist growing more insecure, he is he's growing more, he is growing richer all right, but he is more and more insecure, more and more uncertain, uncomfortable. Now, he is open to cyclical movements of income ahead of him which are essentially a function of his investment activities. If you were not investing so much looking for constant augmentation of capital stock and technology, there would not be so much cyclical movement. The more he pushes himself into an innovation, the more deeply he pushes himself into the possibility of cycles. So, this is the second. The third, as the capitalist come face to face with the, with the reality, they find two options open to them. Should I expand my business by creating more structures, expanding my capital size, building another factory with more technology, more advanced technology or should I simply buy up another factory which is somewhere which is owned by somebody else. The option is which is cheaper. If I buy up somebody else's business, then I have a going proposition in my hands. I do not have to spend so much money on building everything anew, right. 
the moment I think of this some predatory process has started in capital among the capitalists. The bigger capitalists are now looking to buy the smaller capitalists. We will stop at this point and continue with Marx in the next class.